Hello and welcome to Tools in the Shed, a podcast powered by Cars Guide, ready to rip into car stuff that's caught our eye this week. I'm Cars Guide Deputy Editor James, and with me is Senior Journalist Richard. Hello. And Deputy News Editor Justin. Howdy. This week, we're looking at an off road legend and cultural icon, comprehensively rebooted, possibly for another multi decade run. We'll give you our thoughts on some new entrants to the Cars Guide garage this week, and we'll catch up with the ultimate expert on just about anything you can think of in this week's Must Watch. So stay with us. But first, some feedback. Last week, we were talking primarily about the Mazda BT50, and I thought Stuart Marler came in with some really interesting thoughts. He said he can see the Mazda sales pitch. It'll be a premium ute with less compromise for people coming out of a passenger vehicle. So that this newer one, the way it looks, the way it might feel, etc., calls out the advent of two-wheel drive SUVs that, his words, candidly admit to never seeing the dirt, wouldn't be surprised to see a Mazda city ute. So it becomes mm. this uh, phenomenon where it's not a work truck, it's not an off-road thing, it's a, it's a city ute. I thought that was a really interesting idea. I think he's um, right. I think, I think the, the, the ute itself looks like it was designed by a 15-year-old in his bedroom or her right. bedroom because it doesn't look quite right to me. Like, it looks exactly yeah. how you'd imagine it to look. You take the front end of, a, like, a, you know, yeah. a Mazda 6 and you put it on the back end of a ute. It just doesn't look like it all joins together very well. Okay. My I mean, yeah. he's, he's talking about the trim level, the safety mm. tech, all mm. the mod cons. Um, it's more about surfboards oh, yeah. and mountain bikes for city slickers, yeah. and my mind went to the Hyundai Santa Cruz, which, yeah. which of course, is very much down that, that road. Recreational. Um, but, mm. Yeah, interesting, yeah. though. Mm. Um, mm. Now, Jim Danock says he sees the Isuzu, he sees Isuzu building a ute for Mazda as a win-win, and he's right. Mm. Isuzu gets the volume to cover their development and production costs, and Mazda gets to park a ute in its showrooms. <laughs> you know, so that... That's ideally how these JVs or, you know, uh, badge engineered. It's more than that, I suppose. But um, that's how they should work. Um, he says, given Mazda's history in selling utes, a premium Mazda ute is not as big a sell as a Navara-based X-Class. You know what I mean? And I, I think that's really interesting. Mazda pricing will probably also make it competitive, unlike the X-Class. And I think in our reviews, Crafty uh, was pretty careful in his dissection of the X-Class and his summation was that there wasn't enough done to differentiate the car from a Navara, and it's hard to argue with that. Often in traffic, I'll see an X-Class from behind and do a double take as to whether it is, in fact, a Navara or an X-Class, things like that, the interior. But um, Mazda, Mazda has obviously done a good job of, of making it very Mazda-fied. Yeah, yeah, definitely. They've put a lot of effort into the interior, particularly with uh, material quality, you know, adding those kind of soft touch plastics and what have you to the dash and, and other places and, and things like uh, knee mm. rests as well, mm. um, which you don't get in the D-Max from what I understand. So right, it's definitely absolutely. trying to bring a bit of that Mazda premiumness, if you will, to yeah, the and equation. Mazda are the masters of making uh, an interior look premium and on a budget because they're still affordable cars. So yes. somehow they're able to design it and style it and their the build and craftsmanship is fantastic. Will, um, it's interesting mm. you say that, Richard, because our best uh, Kiwi bro, uh, Max tri uh, Wax Triple Three, Max Triple Three, no, Wax Triple Three, um, Isuzu all the way, he puts his hand up to being Isuzu biased, but he thinks the Isuzu Mazda JV is good. Uh, they could learn a few things from each other. Isuzu can now find a way to tart their interiors up a bit yeah. and put more class into them. So yeah. it'll be interesting to see how the other side of that equation works. Mm. If anything that's done fundamentally underpinning the interior allows Isuzu to do, you know, a, a, a plusher job on, on furnishing the cabin. It could also yeah. be market dependent because Australia, as we know, uh, tends to have higher specification versus other markets in the world. Mm. So it could be possible that the Australian version of the D-Max might take some of those nicer bits, whereas in other markets it might be a bit more agricultural. So, Tom, will yes. Got to say, though, I've never got into, a, in an, into an Isuzu D-Max and gone, whoa, this is pretty plush. <laughs> <laughs> They're pretty practical is the right or word even for it. Or yeah. even this is pretty <laughs> as opposed to plush. 
Yeah, now, but yeah. You, you, we've got Stuart Marler talking about the city ute, but then Andre Vaugeur says he hopes Mazda will do an SUV wagon based on the BT50, like the MUX is to the D-Max. So, you know, when you think about Fortuna and Everest and yeah. Pajero Sport and all of those ute-based trucks, um, Hammer Rocks, our old mate Hammer, came in and said, you know, it'd be nice to see a BT50 wagon. Maybe he'd call it Mazda Tribute, re, re, uh, <laughs> reboot that name. Yes. Um, but he thinks it could cannibalise Mazda's existing sales when you've got cars like a CX-5, CX-9. Doubts yeah. we'll see one. But Andre comes back and says, well, Hammer, uh, they'll lose a sale because I'm not going to buy either of them. Proper 4x4 doesn't see the point of a city SUV. So maybe there is room for something that's just a little tougher and a little more, mm. you know, nuts and boltsy. Possibly, well, given the but... MUX that exists, it makes a lot of sense. But what Mazda's saying at the moment is it's not going to happen. Um, right. But, yeah. you know, that might change, of course, in the future. I think yeah. Mazda need to be take a bit of warning from Toyota there. You know, one of the, <clears throat> you know, the biggest car companies in the world uh, can't really get Fortuna to sell very well. So if Toyota can't get the Fortuna to sell, sell well, I don't think a, you know, a Ute-based seven-seater SUV by Mazda will either. So Yeah, I wouldn't mind careful. a tribute. The new, the new yeah. tribute, I think, um, well, let's start a groundswell. I wouldn't mind yeah. seeing that. Yeah. Um, Eddie Fuentes, BT50 owner and likes the new model better than the car he has. Uh, Kodo interior and exterior looks good. There you go, Richard. Mm -hmm. um, mm. Not keen on the four-cylinder, would prefer his current five-cylinder or a six. Maybe the turbo petrol from CX-5 and CX-9. Mm. So, you know, all of those things are feasible down the track. Mm. But um, I, I get the feeling this car will be around for a little while. Yes, um, he also says, screw the merch, because we were talking about uh, uh, David Burt <laughs> wanting some merch last week. Um, <laughs> Can I have your big ring spanner, please, JC? <laughs> Which is over, over there. Oh, I'm a drink um, first. I would say, Eddie, it is actually a ring open ender. You just can't see the open end part. And I need it to tighten some very big nuts. So <laughs> it, won't be, it won't be going anywhere. Thank you. Mm. Um, Hammer mm. Rocks jumped back in. Ah! He's, he's, he's amazed the ute market is morphing into the new large rear-wheel drive sedan battle of yesteryear. You yeah. know, he remembers... 10 to 15 years ago, one monthly mm -hmm. car public publication, <laughs> Wheels, ran yeah. a Commodore or Falcon or HSV, mm. FPV or both on its cover for about yeah. 15 months straight. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, you would think they're the only cars that we bought or were interested in in Australia. What's next? Electric vehicles doing battle for Australia's best-selling car in the next de uh, decade. And, you oh, know, he's a you prophet. He's a prophet. Isn't he? When, when you think back, it's been quite a decade in mm. automotive terms, uh, in terms of development. So 2030, who's to say that absolutely yeah. uh, might be the case? What I would say about the uh, Commodore and Falcon covers, and Richard, you've been in that world as mm. well, um, it's a bit like the Women's Weekly putting Princess Di or Chuck, you know, on the yeah. cover when they were yeah. at their peak. Yes. It's a safe bet you know that you're going to get a certain circulation result because they're on the cover. Same with Commodore and Falcon when they were in their heyday and the HSV and FPV. Yeah. It's a conservative cover because you know you're going to get a certain number. You know people are going to go to the newsstand. You know if you put 392 kilowatts with two exclamation marks after it with a picture of a HSV or a FPV below it that people will pick it up. It was always yeah. a little bit iffy uh, about putting like a – you know, a Mercedes Benz hatch or something like that on. It's like, oh, good God. Yes. You know, no yes. one get this. So. I remember when uh, Bill Thomas <laughs> arrived at Wheels Magazine, he wanted to put an Audi a, um, RS5. That's V8, right. Uh, yeah. AMG C or E class V8, BMW yeah. M3 at that stage V8. So yeah. all V8s, performance, a trio of them. And there was yeah. just there was nervousness in the building oh, because oh. that was, that was look, it's not a Commodore and it's not a Falcon. So, yeah, mm, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. Now, We'll leave that there and go to more general comments that we've had. Uh, David Burt again. Now, Peter Anderson last week was talking about local manufacturer because David uh, is very much a proud, I, I like to call him Bertie. Um, he's a very proud Victorian. And uh, Peter Anderson mentioned that the Renault 12 was actually built in Australia, in Sydney, in Zetland. Um, and David says, how could I forget or remember, for that matter, exclamation point, um, <laughs> He's thinking that the Renault 16, perhaps the first true hatch, was a much better car, assembled in Victoria too. And I, I would argue that the Renault 4, which I believe was also built in Clayton, 
um, from about 64 to 66, several of which I have owned, was also a hatchback and, and built in Victoria. So, David, I'm adding that into the mix. Wow. Mm. Wow. Great car. Renault 4 is a great car, as is the Renault 16. They're fabulous. Um, now, Stuart Marler, we were talking about Boston Dynamics and their robot dog. Oh, and God. Boston Dynamics call it Spot, but SpaceX has one that they call Zeus. All right, And its job is to head into areas that aren't safe for humans or real dogs to sniff out stuff that may have um, vented from a rocket or, you know, toxic stuff. And it goes in there with cameras and other things on it. So Stuart Marler says, Higgins Dogs in Magnum PI were Zeus and Apollo. Yep. If Elon names something Apollo in the near future, wow. you heard it here first. So, uh, yeah, good call. Pretty much call. everything I know about life I learned from Magnum. Magnum um, PI. I've got the box set behind me, actually, if anybody, any of our viewers want to want to borrow it. Um, Th there are those photographs of you, Richard, holding a very handsome young woman, uh, yes. helping her learning how to swim. Learning how to that swim. A, a, a magnum is going. going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I've got the short shorts. Hey, JC, We're, have we heard from the from the person that accosted me recently? Yes. No, that was yes. last week. We, oh, right. okay. we we called out Stuart's call out to you. Yes. Um, about the five day view of the Tesla share price. So that is now entrenched. Uh, in our right. format. Yes. Um, Jim Danik had a comment on the Aston Martin that I was driving uh, just recently and said, is there a vegan version of the DBS Superleggera? Because so many cows had given up their existence to trim <laughs> their, even their, their headlining is leather. Um, the, the A and B posts are all leather. Everything is this uh, leather. And to that, I'd say there is a thing called Aston by Q. Now, that plays mm. on the James Bond thing, of course, with Q being the quartermaster for MI6 who doles mm. out all the gizmos. So you can go to Aston by Q. You can have that thing trimmed in, you know, rice paper if you want. Those, they will do <laughs> anything. So, mm. yes, there would be a vegan version of the DBS Superleggera available. Um, ostrich feathers uh, around the Ooh. steering wheel, I'm sure, would be possible. Mm. But Jim also Ooh. said he's a Hyundai brand fan. He's got a Tucson an i30N and a Veloster Turbo in the garage. So that is definitely a Hyundai fan. Wow. Um, in the coming years, we'll be looking for a 3.5-tonne towing vehicle and can't see moving to another brand, even if a future Hyundai Ute is shared with another manufacturer. So I think we've learned that Jim is a potential grey nomad. He's, he's going to head out there yeah. with the trailer in tow and, you know, circle around the country. Peter Painting came in and said, what about Hyundai Palisade yes. or Santa Cruz? And mm. Jim said, well, the Palisade's nice, mm. but monocoque construction means it's 2.3 tonne towing capacity max, way short of what's needed for grain nomads. Mm. Santa Cruz is same construction, so not expecting large towing capacity, mm. which is a fantastic segue into our main topic of conversation today. Well done. Because the new Land Rover Defender Mm. is very much a monocoque construction. That's the big move mm. away from its predecessor. Yeah. But it has a towing capacity of three and a half tonnes. And I think in certain configurations, you go up to a bit over 3.7 tonnes. So the news this week, Justin, I might throw to you, is that there's mm. been announcement of a new version of this car that could be cutting the grass of utes that people are driving and looking at buying right now. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of people have been calling for a Defender Ute and Land Rover's delivered something a little bit different. Um, so some of you might recall the hard top. Uh, that is making a comeback for the new generation Defender. And uh, yeah, those unfamiliar with the hard top is basically a stripped out Defender that is kind of like a Ute with a canopy, I guess you could say. Um, so the second or third rows are stripped out and you've basically just got the first row of seating. Um, you've got hardened materials inside, so you can actually fit a pallet inside as well if you wanted to, too. It is very much, uh, I guess, a commercial version of the, of the Defender. Um, it's versatile and very focused in its nature. It comes with steel wheels, still has all that kind of off-road capability as well that you Love get it. from the regular Defender, despite yeah. the fact, again, it's, it's a monocoque, but... Um, you can even option a, a jump seat in the first row, so you can have three seats if you really wanted to, too. Ah, um, so good. But yep. it, is, it is basically as close to a Defender Ute as we can get at the moment, but again, unless, it's still got unless, the hard top on. 
unless you break out the angle grinder or the gas axe and just, Could. you know, either put a like a cabriolet <clears> strip <throat> down the middle of the yeah. roof or take the whole thing off. Absolutely. And I have no do doubt it. the aftermarket will do that. There'll be For some sure. sort of modification <laughs> yeah. out there to turn it into that genuine new. Now, ju Justin, now from from memory from that story, it retains yes. the the um the passenger rear doors, doesn't it? Because the original yeah. hard tops were only two doors, and a yeah, panel van right. type style. Yeah. So you can uh, well, they're saying you can get the the hard top in three door and five door body style. That's so right. Got it. That's right. Exactly right. So yeah. the yeah. image that they've kind of released of it so far has got the five door. Five door. So yeah. you know, theoretically, you could open those rear doors and access that. Uh, yeah. area that uh, mm. i guess is your load bed if you will um, I, I think so i actually succeeded in um digging out an image that has both the 90 and 110 uh, as yes. okay, hard yep. top so yeah yep yep so people on youtube might be able to see that yeah Look. absolutely but you've got that extra versatility of the extra two doors so you know for some people the 110 will be quite useful i, I think it's be it, go ahead richard sorry, sorry I, look i hate to be the um you know the the downer on this. Um, no, you don't. Think... You love it. You love it. <laughs> All right, I do love it. But in terms of Toyota having to worry about Hilux, you know, losing sales, I don't think Toyota has anything to worry about. I think um, as much as I love the Defender as much as the next person, um, I really think it's the it's the mini of SUVs, really. And I think it's going to be designed for people who are style conscious. So I think you're going to see, you know, Chelsea flower show gardener type celebrity gardeners with these vehicles, which are incredibly like minis, also really well put together and yeah. really capable. I mean, yeah. quite capable on a racetrack. Come, some of them are, um, but I just don't think uh, Toyota has anything to worry about in terms of having sales go to uh, that's true. To Land Rover. That's true. Mm. I mean. The, the, we, our own Tom White um, wrote a story uh, in 2019 where he'd spoken to Land Rover Australia's local MD, mm. uh, Mark Cameron, who's saying uh, that it would be positioned here at least as a volume seller, um, and that's in, in Land Rover terms. So they, they want to move a few of these. So trying to pigeonhole it as a tough truck is yeah. not going to work. Mm. They might have that as a, a tiny niche within the niche. Uh, oh, yeah. But they, they want to try and sell as many as they can. And to your point, Richard, the reason why um, it might become the Tourac tractor or the, mm. the double bay shopping trolley yes. is that it looks so beautiful. Oh. Oh, it's always mm. subjective. I just think it looks so cool. Oh, absolutely. And it will sell. It will sell in Land Rover terms like hotcakes. I reckon it's got the potential to be their second best seller after, you know, Range Rover. Um, definitely better than I think Discovery Sport. Um, I, I honestly think it will sell really well, but I, I, I think it will never be used to its full potential. Um, yeah. And you could take that Defender anywhere, um, yeah. anywhere a Hilux can go. It's got, you know, like a 12 meter wading depth. It's got, well, it doesn't, mm. I think it's like 800 millimeters, but it's oh, very, it's very nine capable. meters. Oh, oh, nine okay, 800 <laughs> millimeters. Yep. It's very capable, but it's like you said, it's going to spend its road time on the roads of Turak and Melbourne and, you yeah. know, other affluent suburbs around Australia. So, yeah. yeah. To that yeah. point, Land Rover uh, Australia hasn't even confirmed the hardtop That's version. right. So that, right. that tells you as much as you, you need to know, right? Because when the right. Defender was originally revealed, you know, they were yeah. very quick to say it's coming this time, it's going to start from this much. The, the hardtop, they haven't committed to it at all. They've said they're obviously evaluating it for Australia, but it just goes to show obviously what they're thinking internally is, you know, there might not be a market for a really commercialised yeah. version of the Fender. You know, you know be... that what that would be? In the days when we had motor shows, you'd bring one in, put it on a motor show stand and actually find out what people thought of it and get yes. some kind of face-to-face -face feedback. Yeah. But now it'll be if they get some inquiry, if they get online, you know, people saying, oh, we Facebook. love that. It'll yep. be that kind of thing. But, mm. but when you think about the Defender in terms of its development, the DC100, which was the concept that, that kind of was a prelude to the whole thing, that was 2011. So yeah. they, they had a design that was very close to being frozen, best part of 10 years ago. So this is a long-term project, and I'm sure they're trying to replicate, you know, the previous Defender and before that the Series 1 and 2 and 3. It was like 60-odd years, maybe more, uh, in market. Yes. This, it, time will tell whether or not this has legs to to go on through various generations. Yeah, it could be in for long haul, definitely. I mean, a lot of those, I mean, I guess it's a monocoque at the end of the day, but a lot of those more uh, light commercial vehicles, you know, they're 
platforms these days seem to last, you know, 12 years. So, yes, you know, yes. You, know, well, we, we, you think about Toyota's 70 series and, and Toyota probably oh. came up to a similar fork in the road. Like, okay, do we, do we try and make the 70 series a little more modern, safer, you know, that, that uh, five-star ANCAP safety in Australia is a big deal for a lot of fleet buyers, so they had to have a model that was um, safer. But they wanted to keep that body on frame toughness and they put the mm. investment into the 70, uh, 70 series. Land Rover went, no, nah, clean sheet, we're going to go off in a different direction. So it would be interesting to see if people kind of cross shop these two. It seems far less likely than it might have been in the past. It does. Look, I think Land Rover's done, I've done this really, really well. They haven't gone into a joint venture with anybody to try and, you know, save money. Um, Look, I think the only thing that might actually jeopardise anything is Brexit um, in terms of where it's built and, and the cost of production. Um, yep. But, um, look, I think, I, think, I think that Land Rover Defender is here for at least the next, I would say, decade. Um, yep. there, it's been a decade in gestation, so I think they've done it exactly right. And I think the looks, um, the looks alone and the heritage alone will make that yep. car incredibly popular. I, mm. I mm. want a base model 90 on Steelys, and yes. you, you're looking... The You're looking steelies. at the, the uh, Justin, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we're starting at around the 70K mark yeah, for the four-door. Right. That's for the 110, um, and that'll probably be late this year and then uh, um, yeah. or thereabouts. And then promise of a 50-ish two-door 90 model um, maybe next year. So that, that'd be the one on steel rims. And there was also <laughs> a whisper of a third body style, a longer one, a 130. Mm. Is there any update on that to your knowledge, Justin? No, I haven't heard so many whispers uh, in addition to the original rumours, but, yeah, it definitely sounds like a longer wheelbase seven-seater with a bit more room, so that would yeah, very yeah. much fit into that kind of lifestyle uh, you, where you could have the kids along as well and, and travel as far as you want. So it'll yeah. be interesting to see if that comes to fruition. Definitely. I, I, I think it'd be great to hear from 70 Series Land Cruiser owners previous generation Defender owners, mm. people who are in that kind of market, would you ever buy a Defender as a ute alternative? Just to get some feedback would be terrific. Absolutely. And look, that that X grade as well has got a three litre inline six that makes 294 kilowatts. 300 wow. kilowatts. Wow. Yeah. That's, That's great. And it's pretty have you light got, have, you got a, have you got a talk number there too, Richard? We have got... Uh, Yes, 550 newton metres of torque in that. Mm. So that's okay, a that's weapon. <laughs> that is plenty. Yeah, that is plenty. I mean, the V8 obviously was a big part of the previous yeah. Defender, but I don't think you're going to miss it when you've got that yeah, kind of so, engine. No. So mm. there you go, Jim Danik. You know, there's, there's a monocoque, uh, aluminium monocoque yeah. vehicle mm. that um, seems to have some legs in terms of your uh, grey nomad aspirations. Uh, it could be worth considering. Do it. Now, we will now move on to our garage and cars that the three of us have been driving this week. Um, Justin, you've been in an SUV, but it is not a typical SUV. It's quite atypical. Oh. Tell us why. Uh, it is the most powerful SUV on sale in Australia currently, that being Ooh. the Jeep Grand Cherokee Trackhawk. Yes, it's a Jeep. Yes. Um, it is, I pick, only picked it up yesterday, so I've literally had uh, you know less than 24 hours. <laughs> Off the wheel, and I'll tell and you what. Still in one piece. Onto the wheel. <laughs> yes, yes. So, <laughs> it's got uh, 522 kilowatts of power Whoa. and uh, 868 newton meters of torque from a, a 6.2 liter supercharged V8. So holy, cow. that engine is straight out of the uh, Challenger and Charger uh, Hellcat. Hellcat, uh, yeah. yeah. Which is obviously a, a muscle car that's designed to do one thing: go on a straight line really fast. Um, so what better way to add to that recipe than raising the centre of gravity, making it really high in a, in a, a Jeep Grand Cherokee and seeing yeah. what happens. And uh, the answer is I'm still not sure it goes around corners. Uh, yeah. well, I, I, it definitely in, goes fast. I can chip in line. there, Justin. The, the Jeep in Australia had the launch for that vehicle, which I attended yes. at Phillip Island. Indeed, and yeah. um, driving it around there, that, that last turn out onto the start-finish straight, mm at pace in that thing mm. was pretty exciting. Yes. Yeah. I, I would love to drive it on the track and really see what the track <laughs> hawk, if the track hawk lives up to its name. I but somehow it's, it's, think that it's, it's not quite a track weapon so much as it's a straight line weapon. It's such glorious madness. You know, yeah. it's, it's one oh of those God. things where 
you get you buy the car, you mm-hmm. bring it home, you get the whole family in it, <laughs> go to your local quiet road, press launch control, do a zero to hundred k blast, job done. That's it. That's what that truck is about. And 100%. it sounds so epic. Oh my god! It's like the monitor. <laughs> It's a supercharger one <laughs> as well. Like, you yeah. just cannot ignore that's, it. When it is on, it is on. That's uncanny, Richard. That sounds just like the track hawk. That's incredible. <laughs> it does. I haven't driven the track hawk. I've, 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 I've watched it on the track. Um, but I've driven just a regular SRT Jeep Grand Cherokee. And I've got to say, you know, going around corners, it, it, it boggles the mind how, you know, a block of flats like that with that yeah. much power can actually go around a corner so well and flat. It's just unbelievable. And the other thing about the noise is that with a supercharger, you, you've got a lot more to play with in terms of exhaust yeah. noise because you don't have to worry about turbos kind of robbing you of chopping it up, th- yes. throughput and, mm. and all of that. So, yeah, it's, it sounds like a beast. Mm. Um, now, it's surprisingly easy to drive around town. Like, you learn very quickly how to baby it, as in don't give it much throttle. Um, and you can actually drive it around town and take advantage of the fact that it's a it's a large five-seater and, and be quite comfortable. But then the second you stick the boot in, Bell is literally unleashed. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Now, Richard, um, you've been unleashing hell in an oh. altogether different SUV yourself, haven't you? But it's... Yeah. Um, a kind of light version of what we've just been talking about. Very light, 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 light. Um, it's, I think it's got like a probably a fifth the the uh, kilowatts of Justin's um, Jeep Grand Cherokee. Um, I've been in a Mazda CX-5. It's the top of the range of Kira. It's got the 2.5 litre petrol, um, only 140 kilowatts and 252 yeah. newton metres. Right. Um, <laughs> look. Try harder. Look, try, I know, I know. <laughs> Look, it, it's really the problem with reviewing the Mazda CX-5 is trying to find problems with it. Um, and it's re- it's really easy to review a car when things go wrong. Do you know what I mean? Because you, there's, there's lots to say, you know, this happened, this fall off, hell off and all that type of thing. But when you get into a car and you're like, no, nah, that's fine. That's great. Um, and the Mazda <laughs> CX-5 is a bit like that. Yeah, the only right. thing I can say that, you know, that I would in, that needs to be improved is that, you know, Mazda do know how to do a brilliant interior, but I do think that the interior is starting to get on a little bit. The screen mm. now is like as tiny as an mm. iPhone type of thing sitting up there on the dashboard. Um, the ride, the Mazda like a, like a firmer ride uh, and just driving around where I live on the pothole roads, it is a little bit, I've been in some, you know, softer riding cars and the same getting straight out of those and into this, it's like, oh God, it's like right. going from, you know, yep. A lounge seat to suddenly, you know, a, a, you know, a wooden chair, a wooden kitchen bench. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, right. Yeah. Um, right. But look, the Starling's holding up well. The boot is big, and um, you know, I've, the seats come a little bit hard. Um, but again, this is what I'm saying. You know, when a car is so good like this, you start yes. looking at, you start splitting hairs. So yes. But it's, yeah. Yeah, it's, I mean, it, it has copped it a bit of heat from the the more recent Rav and and the, mm. the way that in, car's interior is treated. But um, yeah, it still stands up very well, doesn't it? Absolutely. I mean, when it came out a few years ago, it was held up as the benchmark. And the Rav Four really is the benchmark now in terms of the packaging inside and the number of USB ports and the space and the and the drivability. So I'd like to see uh, Mazda now sort of try and trump Rav, um, and that's mm, going to be yep. hard because that car, that Rav Four, is excellent. Very good. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Now, um, I'll come in with a Toyota. It's a Kluger GX all-wheel drive, so it's seven-seater. Um, it's just under the 50K mark, so that's the, the kind of sand pit it's playing in. Three-and-a-half-litre V6 petrol, no turbo, eight-speed auto, and it's about 218 kilowatts and 350 newton metres to move a two-ton um, seven-seater. So, that's reasonable outputs, but it's also quite a hefty uh, kind of machine. Yeah. In the plus column, I put that it rides really well. I find that the, the Kluger has a surprisingly compliant ride, and it's a surprisingly engaging drive. I went down my kind of test road and found myself having half a go, like, wow, this is, this is really good fun, um, which was a bit of an eyebrow raise. It also has things like radar cruise, which is super handy, and the GX is nowhere near the top spec um, of that model. 
The sliding second row is really good um, because the seven seats, you can create a little bit more room for the kids in the last row. And it has vents up in the ceiling for each row, um, which is super handy as well. I thought they were all big pluses. On the negative side, no CarPlay, no Android Auto, uh, tiny little Whoa. media screen, yep. uh, no digital speedo, things like that in the media and, and uh, kind of readout system. And the third row is actually tiny. Um, it would even be small kids that go back there because mm. I tried. To, I got in there and I felt like I was trying to get into a jam jar and then get the <laughs> lid on, you know. It was, it was pretty small. So um, you want to have the smallest kids in the family back there and win mm. a bit of space by moving that second row forward. But all up at that just sub 50K, it, was, it presents very nicely and I found it drove surprisingly well. That was the, the biggest surprise for me. It's been a while it? since I've been in a Kluger. Any fuel economy thoughts yet? Uh, yes. Let me see. I don't have them to hand. Because from I memory, we are around thirsty. It was around 13 yeah. uh, was mm. my real world number, mm. which is uh, higher than their claim. But I might double check and we can uh, super that when we put mm. that podcast up on YouTube if I'm not, off the mark. Not quite as high as the 25 litres I'm currently <laughs> uh, track yeah. hawk. You, you're never yeah. going to go sub 20 uh, litres per hundred in that. Nope. Yeah. No. 7.8 for the Mazda CX-5, by the way, guys. <laughs> oh, is it? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Not bad. Well, look, talking about big power and big consumption, it's time <laughs> for Musk Watch. Okay, well, what a week. What a week Woo. it has been for yes. the dear leader. Now, he has been trolling the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission in the US. They have a long-term kind of fight going on, and we're talking years, yeah. that has impacted Tesla financially, Elon personally. He was booted out of the chairman's position, et cetera, at Tesla. Um, now, they've had some good results uh, this week, and we'll get to that a bit later. But Elon went out with a tweet saying, SEC, three-letter acronym, middle word is Elon's. So S Elon's C. Right? Very, security, very security, clever. Security wonderful, Elon. Wonderful um, juvenile humor there. Yeah. And then Sam came in and said, Elon, your short shorts line is ready, sir, because he's always had a beef with short sellers on the Tesla stock. And this guy has created some very shiny satin red pants with yeah. some stripes down the side and S Elon's C uh, down the side of these pants. <laughs> and Elon said, yeah, not bad. But then others came in with their take on it. Uh, Connor Sturgeon said, sell Elon's colon. Um, High Wave Candle said, swab Elon's clamminess, which I, thought, which I thought was pretty good. Jeez, um, Tara he is clammy. Burt, Tara Burt says, silence Elon's cake hole. And like Nick, Nick 2.0 said, this may be the douchiest tweet ever. And I don't, know, I, don't know, I don't know whether he means his own tweet or whether he meant Elon's, but I, I get the feeling he meant Elon's. Uh, he's a, now, sounds great. Now, we don't have to go far from Twitter to stay with a particular theme here. And Elon just came out of the blue with a tweet saying, thank you, Angie, dot, dot, dot. Now, it turns out this is a reference to a high-profile virologist in the States called Dr. Angela Rasmussen. Um, she focuses on pathological emerging viruses. You get the drift. It's Ebola. It's other COVID things, the COVID-19, the whole bit. Now, then Elon followed it with something's messed up about medicine that's anti-science. In science, you question everyone, no matter who they are. Facts and reasoning are everything. But in medicine, too much emphasis is on, <clears throat> pardon me, credentials, often by people who've accomplished nothing but a PhD thesis used by no one, right? So he's been very outspoken in terms of what he believes are the number of false positive tests for COVID-19, that the reality is far different to the stats that people are seeing in the media, et cetera. Now, just to put this in context, Elon went to the University of Pennsylvania. He got an undergraduate degree in economics and he did a second bachelor's degree in physics. He was going to go to Penn State or to Stanford to do a PhD in energy physics, but left after two days to start his first startup in Silicon Valley. So he's got two undergraduate degrees. Now, Angela Rasmussen, I won't list them all. It's just too far to go. She starts out with MAs, then postdoctoral fellowships, research assistant professor, 
Um, she's now a search resistant, uh, uh, associate research scientist, Columbia Mailman School of Public Health. So she is exceptionally well qualified yeah. to be commenting all this. Uh. So she came back to Elon and said, if I was asked to comment on the intricacies of the luxury electric car market or how to secure NASA contracts, I'd defer to him. Yeah. So saying, look, you know, this is where I am. That's where you are. Yeah. And R.S. Tanner said, dear doctor, very nice and patronising, you realise Elon Musk knew little about luxury cars and NASA before he started those businesses. So you don't want to just diss someone because they don't have any, uh, they have a differing viewpoint and they don't have degrees or experience right? So that's, mm. that's what he said. And Angela Rats Rasmussen said, no one benefits if people with platforms allowing them to reach millions are spreading demonstrably fa false information mm. and public health guidance. So Look, it, it's just him being, I know everything about everything. That's right. Look, she's yeah. exactly right. Because look, Elon, what he doesn't, what I don't think he's grasping here is that he's incredibly influential. Yet yeah. he doesn't understand a topic. Now, sometimes the people that know the least are the most influential. So really, she needs to have his type of status to the point where her views can be, you know, yeah. transferred around the world. But yeah, yeah, unfortunately, Elon's got to be careful because some of the stuff he's saying is potentially, you know, damaging. Too true. I mean, people mm. go to the internet for information on Magnum PI, Richard, when they should actually be coming direct to me to, to the me. source. Exactly. Do you know what? Um, Higgins, look, look into Hoy Higgins because Higgins is actually the owner of the estate and he's pretending to be just the. Yeah, ah, that's right. That's is that right? right? Uh -huh. Does he own the yeah. Fazer as well? Does he own yeah, the yeah, it's, it's That's the rumor. The rumor is Higgins wow. is the big boss. But it was really interesting. It was a bit of an all in brawl. And then this guy who I love, Lewis Jones, came in and said, Look, two unqualified men are trying to explain these graphics using stuff they've read on the internet to a woman who is exceptionally qualified scientific expert in this exact field and already knows what these graphs mean and probably helped map them. So, yeah. so it's a really great take on the whole thing. Just, you, mm. you, you do, you, as you say, Richard, you do well in this area, you yeah. do in this, you don't know everything. Just stick no. to your knitting in a way. Keeping it simple, the, the, you know, the, the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker. I don't yeah. know how to make candles. I don't I know, I know how to drive cars and write reviews. Right. <laughs> now, anyway. and then, to finish off, you know, Elon was doing the trolling earlier on with the SEC, <laughs> but he has had a bit of his own medicine in that there's been a very good result for Q2 for Tesla, and he went out there and thanked owners and investors. Love you, two exclamation marks. We'll work super hard to earn your trust and support. And they did over 90,000 deliveries in Q2, which was beyond expectations. Uh, but he's being trolled bigly. Um, I stopped counting at 50 posts of Elon with Jelaine Maxwell, <gasps> who was a close associate um, of Jeffrey Epstein, uh, convicted child prostitution uh, specialist. Um, she's the daughter of publisher Robert Maxwell, um, and who sadly, I think he either he committed suicide or something uh, back in the 90s. Well connected in the UK and the US in elite circles. Hello, Prince, Prince Andrew. Um, and the breaking news is that she's been arrested overnight in Bradford, mm. New Jersey charged with four counts of sex trafficking, a minor, and two counts of perjury. So she's mm. been living in the uh, United States. So Elon, this photograph, look, they could have just been two passing ships in a nightclub. I don't yeah. know. But it's a fairly damning association, and uh, he should probably be concerned. There were calls for further investigation, blah, blah, blah. So just a little bit unnerving there. Um, wow. But, I mean, look, he <clears throat> he does sort of, you know, he, he associates with... Um, you know, the, the Hollywood elite and that all those social circles. There's endless photos of him with Kanye. You know what yes, I mean? Yes, this week. So, yeah. Too I many mean, in orange. I think Kanye's got an orange jacket on. He's yes. got a jumper with a, an orange yes. on Yes. So he's a bit of a fame seeker in that way. I'm hoping that's all it is, you know, yes. and nothing yeah. else. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. look, she's under lock and key and uh, it'll be interesting to see what comes out there. Mm -hmm. uh, but the share price, the share price. Oh, here you go, Stuart. $1,208.66. Yep. When we last checked in, it was $985.98. So Stuart will be able to see the five-day yep. uh, range of this particular yep. share. So it started to lift actually overnight. We're recording this on a Friday morning. It was mm -hmm. overnight US, uh, yep. our time, <clears throat> um, Thursday US time, um, when this Q2 deliveries announcement was made and it mm. started to tick right up. 
And BBC News confirms that they're now the world's most valuable car maker. Tesla is the world's most valuable car maker, roughly $4 billion more than mm. Toyota's current stock market value of $203 billion. So we're calling it like a bit under $210 billion being their market cap. Wow. For how much Crazy. longer? I, look, mm. Toyota sold around 30 times more cars last year, yeah. and its revenues were more than 10 times higher. So mm. for me, it feels now like it is just a hot stock going off. People yeah. are jumping mm. in because this is a, a stairway to heaven yeah. and we'll just make some money without, and gut feel, just not necessarily interrogating the fundamentals of mm. the stock or the company or whatever. It's just got a life of its own now. Yeah, yeah. Look, I'm, I'm, I think we're, we're, it's about to head south. I don't know. I, I know nothing about shocks, stocks and shares. but Do you know all been... about shocks, though? You do I, know a lot about shocks. Yeah. I do know. Jocks, did you say? Or mm, shocks. Did you say? Sorry. That too. Shocks. That too. I do. Shocks yeah, and jocks. I'm the damper guy. The damper guy. Um, <laughs> damper jocks? <laughs> yeah, damper jocks. <laughs> Let's not, let's not go there. Um, look, I think, I think this is, uh, I think there's about to be a bit of a U-turn on terms of these sales. Um, I think Toyota's going to be around quite a bit longer. It's interesting. Years. There have been a lot of naysayers along the way, and we've been amongst mm. them. So yep. we'll, we'll see how long this rocket, what it's happens. going like a Falcon Heavy. Um, we'll yeah. see how much rocket fuel there is in it and how far it goes. Yep. Um, and with that, we have reached the finish line. Thank you, Justin. And thank you, thank you Richard. Thanks, guys. And thanks to our podcast production alchemist, violence expert, and chief, chief biscuit dunker, Mr. Ooh. Pritchard, for his sound and vision excellence. Today, he's in a disturbing Mr. Stay Puffed balaclava, a oh. T-shirt saying, yeah. men have feelings too. For example, we feel hungry. And <laughs> denim mega flare pants direct from Germany. <laughs> Yes, he's bringing them back. He's bringing the flares back. Please pass on the word about the podcast and let us know your thoughts, as several uh, people do, by searching for Cars Guide on Facebook and Instagram using the hashtag CG Podcast or email us at comments at carsguide.com.au. Please do. If you're an iTunes listener, rate and review us. And remember, you can watch us on YouTube. But before we go, this week I caught a documentary on how old racing cars are kept together. Riveting. <laughs> <laughs> it should, I think it should have been like more of a pause between. <laughs> I thought the timing was like, quite good on that. Yeah, that's right. Riveting. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>